Hey everybody, it's Andy. Welcome back to my show where I help you build a career you love. Today we are going to talk about the anatomy of a perfect job search networking message. I love this topic. I love networking. Specifically today we're going to talk about seven shows and tells you need to get into your messages to elicit responses from people. And I'm also going to show you the list of the 10 I think you need to have in your arsenal if you are a job seeker. So welcome everyone. If you are here with me live, you are literally in the middle of my live three-day job search accelerator workshop. So great to have you. Get in the chat. Tell me where you're from. Tell me what you need. Just tell me whatever you want to tell me. Enjoy the community while we go through this. I've got a great lesson. We've got a, uh, I've got a lot of time for a Q&A after, and I think it's going to be a lot of fun. So let's talk about what we're actually going to be speaking about. There is, you know, this workshop is about speed and getting you to the right place the fastest. Regardless of how quickly you want to, want to move, I think networking is a vital component for life, but it's especially important when you're, when you're job searching. And so I want to give you a more thoughtful approach that you can use and really understand kind of the, the concepts, the psychology, the triggers behind this and what, what, will be, what will really, really help you not only in your job search, but, it, but in life. And so I want to give you that more thoughtful approach. I've talked a lot about networking. I've talked a lot about job search networking. There's a bunch of mechanics that you can find out on my YouTube channel if you just go into the search bar and search for networking. But today what I thought would be a good idea to do as a, as a primary lesson is you got you to gotta be able to get to first base before you can round the bases. And if you can't even get to first base, you're not going to be able to score. So it's vital that, you're, that you understand what those messages need to look like to initiate the contact, to open up the conversation, whether it's with somebody that you know, maybe it's a lukewarm relationship, maybe it's a warm relationship, but maybe it's a cold relationship. So we're going we're gonna to talk about a lot of that today. Um, I, think it'll, I think it'll be a lot of fun. Now, before we get into you know, kind of the, the specific seven step shows and tells that I want you to include in these messages. There's a couple of things I want to mention. Now, lots of times you are going to be doing this online and you are, you know, this is going to be to people you don't know, people that you might know. These might be cover letter styles. You might be targeting bosses, a la my boss hunting technique. If you don't know what that is, check that out. But it could be to a variety of people. We're going to talk about the triggers you need to have in each of the in each of the messages, no matter who you're sending this to, to or about what. Meaning whether you're opening up a networking relationship, you're asking for a job, or whatever it might be. So I want I want you to hang on to that. And the other thing is, I want you to I want you to be you. You need to, you need you need you need, you need to put your personality into your messaging. I don't want you to be me. I want you to be you. But I also want you to keep in mind that you have to adjust your tone in each of the messages based on the strength or the warmth or the coolness of the relationship of the person that you're trying to contact. If it's somebody that you know pretty well, you can be a lot more casual. If somebody that you kind of know, you could be a little more friendly. If it's somebody you don't know, you might want to be more professional. I don't really care what you got to do. You can be flirty. You can be funny. You can be whatever. I want you to be you, but I want you to be smart about the language you use as you communicate. Now, the genesis of where um, I, I think a lot of the detail came from around what I what I do related to this topic is, you know, I was coaching individuals just to kind of through my one-on-one -on -one coaching, and then in the early onset of the job search boot camp, which I originally launched in 2017, and I know you, you a lot of you guys know I have a promotion going on right now. I would I would talk to people about okay, well, it's smart to network, and here's you know here's kind of what you need to do, and you want to make sure you contact these kind of people. And some of my one-on-one -on -one coaching clients would come back, and they would say, well, you know, my friends are not getting back to me, old co you know colleagues I used to work with, people I love wouldn't get, won't get back to me. You know, I'm trying to target people that I don't know; they're not responding. And then some of the early boot campers would send me messages in the comments and ask me questions and say, well, I'm really not getting the responses. So finally, I said, well, you know, you gotta, yeah, show me what you're sending. And what I noticed about what they were sending was they weren't putting in the right content, uh, content, and they weren't hitting the right triggers to actually elicit the prescribed response that they wanted. 
So I started to get more structured around what I would do, what I would say, and then I reverse engineered it to the components that I think you need to know. That's what I'm gonna share with you today. So, the anatomy of a perfect job search networking message, meaning you are writing an email or LinkedIn in mail or whatever it is with the intent of ultimately getting a job. These are the seven show and tells that I would include. My seven show and tells, okay? So number one. Now, you know, you know me. You know I always love to start out with something easy, although I see a lot of people screwing this one up. You got to include who you are. You got to include who you are. Sometimes I'm, I'm floored when people don't, that isn't the first thing out of their mouth or I should say off their fingertips, who, who you are. And, and who you are is made up of what? Well, generally three things, right? You got your name. Hi, my name's Andy. You got your descriptor. I'm a career coach, right? You might have a relationship, right? I'm so-and-so's business partner. I'm so-and-so's friend. I'm, you know, Hey, Lulu, I'm Lulu's nephew. You know, I'm Ricky's fourth cousin on his mother's side. You know, I don't really care what it is, but you got you got some kind of connection that you want to make. I used to work at such and such. Anything that ties you to them or provides reference for them as to who you are. So that should be in there for sure. And it should be first. And it should be first. So you got to start with your name, your descriptor, and that kind of good stuff. Where do we go? Where do we go from there? Okay, numero <laughs> number two. Why did you choose them? Why did you choose them? This, this to me is so important, especially in a cold nature. It warms them up. It shows them that you are tailoring this particular message to them. You took the time to find them and you want to make sure that they know explicitly why you chose them because you have a background in this, because you work here, because you're so-and-so's sister-in-law, whatever it is. But why, why did you, why did you choose them? There's got to be some kind of reference in, in, in that, why, why you, why you chose them. When you do this, when you do something that gives them an indication, they're starting to get a feel that this is a one of a kind message, this will more than double your chance of getting a response. You leave this out, you have a lot less of a chance of them actually responding. How about this one? What do you want? Right, you need to be somewhat specific regarding what you want. Language is like, this is what I want. The reason I'm reaching out is I'm contacting you because I was hoping you could help me with these kinds of things will tell them, okay, now he's now he or she is going to get to the reason that they are contacting me. I know why they chose me. Now I need to know what do you what do you want? So that's number three. And then number four, you gotta show them that you did your research and you did your homework. All right, incredibly important. This is what helps them understand and, and shows and helps you reflect the, on the fact that you are diligent. I was looking I was looking at and noticed and so on, right? And then it led me to you. Words that link the message between you and them to know them that I am sending you this one of a kind message. I'm not sending this generic message to everybody hoping somebody gets back to me. I am sending you this one-of-a-kind message in the hope that you get back to me. Okay, so this, these two here, I want to show you this. I want to repeat this. The why you chose them and the fact that you did your homework and are connecting this for them, this is what personalizes the message. This is what gives it its uniqueness. And this is ultimately, ultimately why they respond back. If you don't have these in your message, you have a very, very slim chance of somebody getting back to you. So two and four is what really, really personalizes it, gives them that, that power. All right, now what? You got to include what you offer, right? You got to include what you offer. Now, you might be thinking, well, Andy, I'm, I'm job searching and I'm really the one that needs something. And I get that, that and that can be tricky, right? You, you might need referrals, you might need whatever. You might need the job. But 
immediately what comes to mind is there's about four things you can offer somebody, right? You can, you can offer them a compliment. You can offer them your network. You might even be able to offer them or be the medium for an employee referral. Maybe you're contacting somebody who works in an organization that you want to work for. They have an employee referral program. You might be offering them a chance to get an employee referral. Okay, there's, all, there's also, I mean, what about the boss hunting technique that a lot of you are familiar with? And again, if you're not, just go to my channel, type boss hunt. You're targeting a person or a manager or a management team or hiring official, whoever it is, and you can offer them your skills, right, to be on their team, to help their organization. That is something to offer. Those are four things right there that you can articulate. But you got to have something that you can offer. There's got to be some attempt made to show them that, to show them that. All right, that was number five. Now, number six. Please and thank you work. Please and thank you work. You've got to show that you're grateful for whatever they can do. You're thankful for their time. You're thankful for their consideration. You're thankful for their referral, their effort. You're thankful that they read this, whatever it is, but you gotta show gratitude. There's gotta be a level of gratitude in the message. And now this one, I cannot believe how many people actually miss this one. Number seven, what is the next step? What is the next step? The more explicit and the more myopic this is, the better it is. The more narrow the next step, the better because it, it, it lets the person respond quickly. Okay, so I need your thoughts on. I need your referral to. I need to know if you work at this company, if you know someone in that organization that I can speak to. It has to be narrow. It has to be narrow. And I'm gonna actually I wanna talk with you a little bit and I wanna I wanna kinda cap off this section of the talk with a sample. If if you throw somebody in a big blue ocean, like, hey, I'm looking, do you know of anything? That is very hard for them to concentrate their brain and and there's a lot of things that they need to connect in order to figure out if there's anything that makes sense for you. So let me give you a great example and we'll kind of talk about this one for a few minutes. There's this guy, his name's Brian. I would call him a friend. He is a longtime business colleague, and I've actually, in the 15 years that I've known him, I got him two jobs. One about 15 years ago, one about seven years ago. So I would, I would call him a friend. We network together. We have lunches, the occasional cocktail, that kind of stuff. A few months back, he sent me an email, as I would expect him to do, and he was emailing me about his son, who I think is about 25, you know, first job out of college, been there a couple, three years, sends me an email, which I have absolutely no problem with, and I appreciate that he sent it. He said, hey, Andy, my son is working at this trading firm, a capital markets trading firm in the financial markets industry, and he's unhappy. Do you know of anything? That was pretty much the, e the email. Now, what's going through my head is I don't, I don't know his son. I don't know what his son does. I don't know if his son is an analyst. I don't know if his son is a project manager. I don't know if his son is a trader, an actuary, a network engineer, or whatever. So I have, n I have no clue. And I also don't know why he's unhappy. I also don't know if he wants to stay in the capital market space, get out, have a career change, or whatever. Now, it would take me 15 minutes to type up an email to ask him all this stuff, which I'm, I wasn't going to do. Now I got to wait till I have, say, 20 minutes in my calendar somewhere where I could actually call him and have a conversation and ask him these questions so he can get me to a spot where I can help him. Took me a month to get back to him. Turns out the kid likes the type of work that he's doing. He's a trader. He's analytical, right? He went to school for this kind of stuff. Doesn't like the capital markets culture. It's very cutthroat. So he wanted to basically get out of that industry and maybe move himself to something else that would allow him to do similar work for maybe a corporation. Um, you know, and what, what immediately came to mind is Brian's words are hanging out in the speech bubble or, you know, what about companies like British Petroleum and and uh, and Coke Industries, or or maybe some of the the investment firms, or the insurance firms, or whatever, where they 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 have uh, individuals inside that look at futures, prices, 
all this stuff. And they do that similar type of trading and all and contract setups and all, all that good stuff. So as we get to talk about this, now I've got a list of three or four companies that his kid was trying to target. I could immediately give him referrals to those companies of people that I knew. Some were in the areas that the kid wanted to go and in other spots, they were just people that could get him to spots that he might want to go. But if his original email would have said, my son's in trading, he doesn't love trading firms, he would prefer to try to get into a corporation where he could have a similar type of position, do you know anyone at British Petroleum Coke, blah, blah, blah. I could have immediately got back to him and my first read of the email, this is somebody I know well. This is somebody who could pick up the phone and call me at any time. It takes me 30 days to get back to him when instead I could have gotten back to him the first time my eyes touched that email. Now, one of a couple things is going to happen when you get down to that myopic question. Some people are going to say, no, I don't. No, that's fine. Then what he could have done is he could have replied to me and said, okay, do you know anybody at these three companies or anybody in this industry or whatever and given me another iteration which I would have had no problem with. Now me being me, what I would have done is why I also know people at these companies but you know he might want to consider these other companies and I know people there, I could have sent him a message back and given him that and then we could have went back and forth and it could have happened very quickly. Now, so think about it. If you are reaching out to people, even if you know them, you have to give them some context. So these seven points that I was talking about here, this is incredibly vital. Now, what are the uses of these, this type of content? So when I say, you know, there are different types of networking messages that you need to have in your repertoire, there are obviously infinitely many, but I think there are 10 really popular ones. And I'm gonna give you an idea of what I mean by networking messages. I'm actually gonna show you a list here. If you bear, uh, bear with me, I should be able to, to pop this over. This is the list of the ones that I think you need to have. So this, um, this here is actually, uh, these are job search networking templates that I've created for people who are in the boot camp, but for purposes of this discussion, you can at least see the kinds of things that I'm that I'm talking about. So, you know, uh, the, when I talked about the boss hunting, so the the ones on the on the um, on the first couple of lines here, these are actually uh, available to the to you right now to anybody watching this. If you go and search for my boss hunting techniques, uh, you could reach out to people uh, who uh, who you think is the boss. And, and and contact them. So there's language, I, or, I, or uh, actually, sorry, let me, uh, okay, the general reach out to a stranger who's likely not the boss. <laughs> the reach out to the stranger who's, who's likely not the boss or person of authority, I've given a couple there. Those are actually are private, but the boss hunting, uh, one where you know you you know a position exists, and you, instead of going through the applicant tracking system, you want to contact somebody. I've given you know language for that. That these two here are actually out in the public domain. So this boss hunting one, whether a position exists, and a boss hunting where you're trying to reach out to somebody if you're not sure whether a position exists. I've actually written copy that you can grab. But think about some of these others. Hey, I know somebody who knows somebody at a company I'm trying to get to, or what do I say to somebody who actually works at a company I'm trying to get in, uh, somebody who I know is well connected and I'm not really sure where they can take me, do you know what to say to that person? Someone I know gave me the name of somebody at my target uh, company. So sometimes people just give you names and they don't necessarily um, you know, make the connection for you, then what do you do? What about someone I know gave me the name of somebody I should connect with in general? Hey, I do that all the time. So people say, well, hey, I'm, I'm looking for something in the financial services arena. I say, hey, you need to go talk to Steve Brown. Okay, and I will make the connection. Now you gotta go from there. Well, you need to know what to say. Um, following up, what about if you meet somebody at a training event or a seminar? These are just a handful of what I would consider to be the very, very base uh, versions of, um, of, the, of the kinds of things that you need to be able to put into, in, into play. And so as you, as you bring yourself 
to the market, there are definitely variations of the kind of things that you're going to need to communicate with people about. And not everybody is going to be, you know, one step and done. And, and the, the boss hunting technique that I actually have a, a, a public video on where you can learn that stuff, those individuals have great luck getting getting return replies when they're using that technique but the, but it isn't always that simple right sometimes you're trying to get to somebody uh, maybe maybe you tried the boss hunting technique that was free and you couldn't get to the boss the boss didn't reply so if you start to put those triggers in those seven that I talked about you're gonna have way better luck you're gonna have way better luck and if you want to know if you have these kinds of of assets in your repertoire I'm gonna show you uh, I'm going to show you what some of the results look like and what some of the ratios look like that I'm talking about. If you want to know if you're being effective, let me just show you. As a matter of fact, a, a lot of you probably got this email from me. Uh, if you opened your email on Monday, these are those 10, te 10 networking templates that I was telling you about. Now, if you want me to be your copywriter and you actually want the templates, these are in the boot camp, and I'm gonna show you what else is in the boot camp, and kinda of this is my little transition from, I wanna show you what I'm talking about and the types of things that you need, and also the types of things that I offer inside the program, if it's something you're interested in. But look at look at these people, and the, the, these are comments from inside the training program, this is what they look like. Kevin was, was struggling, he wasn't sure what to do, he gets in the boot camp, he goes through the searching module, which includes a lot of this these techniques, but in addition to some of the concepts I just shared with you today, there's also the templates themselves and the operating instructions. And, and you know, within two weeks, sending 42 messages out, would you take six interviews within two weeks of just trying and using those templates? Noel, over the weekend, had sent something like a dozen of these things out 75 percent so there's a bunch of you know you can you can kind of get an idea pat is um he's in, these are all people in the boot camp that have access to these templates you know that's what what is that 52 53 percent give or take sends 45 emails gets five phone interviews so i mean these are you know these are people who really uh you know are taking advantage of this and and it works across countries i got this these Two emails here from Rachel. Uh, I got them yesterday and this morning. I literally just created this before we started today. If you look at the lower email, this is a woman. She's a senior vice president in the financial services arena, and she was in South Korea. She followed me. She joins the boot camp sometime this year in the spring. She ends up moving to Germany about a month ago because she met the love of her life. And she says, you know, it's quite quick. Uh, to find a job, you know, in, in Germany, despite you know not knowing the language, she still she goes to classes every day to learn the language. So we had a coaching session. We got her armed with the templates. We talked to her about how to contact actually executive recruiters because she's a very senior person. She ended up getting a job inside of a month, and you know because she had access to these assets. Your program is very uniquely amazing and awesome, which helps me, uh, which helps a lot of people. You know, to pursue their own dream and goal. My life would be a lot different if I had known you a few years earlier. So, I mean, this this stuff works. And 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 on top of that, uh, I wanted to show you what the inside of the program, you know, what the program looks like, just as it relates to to what we're what we're doing here. Um, when you get in the boot camp, and I know, I know, I got a bunch of emails yesterday, which is why I wanted to show this part today. Is what does it look like inside? What's the, you know, what does it truly look like? There's a welcome process. Obviously, we get you oriented, and then there's some guides and demos and ways to work through the the, the program. But this covers, you know, some of the things I mentioned yesterday about, you know, the starting module. This is really as it relates to the self discovery stuff. Marketing is all that relates to to resume writing. What we're talking a lot about here is all the mechanics that it takes to to run uh, to run the perfect job hunt this main session is a couple of hours of all that direction this networking for job seekers is a huge extension of some of the concepts I gave you today so inside this is the seven show and tells but it's also all the operating instructions all the templates how to use them what to expect what to do when somebody gets back to you and says no and all the things that are related to it but what's even what's even more important than knowing what to say who to say it to so how do you find these people 
So we actually teach using um, Google Boolean and LinkedIn X-Ray how to unlock the LinkedIn database to find anybody that you want to, to contact based on the parameters you set the types of companies, the, the company specifically, the titles within the company and so on. Get the people's names. How do you get their email? So where, how do you figure that out? How do you verify it? And then ultimately sending the email and then figuring out what they do with it. Did they open it? How long was it open? Did they forward it to somebody? You know, things of that nature. So it's it's pretty heavy duty stuff, which is why a lot of these people are getting the results that they're getting. And then there's interviewing, which is awesome. And then, you know, negotiating and all that good stuff. And then if you are, I, I mentioned this yesterday, if you're a career changer, there's my full methodology on, um, on how to change jobs. If you are, oops, an executive, uh, or over 50, what are the six or eight things that you need to account for and how do you deal with all those? Uh, there's some other really niche stuff and then there's some Q&A sessions and things of that nature. Those go down you know, earlier and earlier, but whenever we don't have a boot camp blitz uh, like we, we're having now, um, we have we have a, a private monthly session with the boot campers, so anybody that joins at any time can get in, ask their questions and those kind of things. So I just wanted to give you a feel for the seven components that need to go into the networking messages, the types of networking messages that I'm talking about, and then knowing that there's a boot camp promotion going on right now, if you are on the fence, that's what it looks like inside. In addition to all that stuff, you get all the live coaching with me, you also get my $400 career accelerator program for free as well until Friday. So how'd, how'd I do? 26 minutes. Okay, I don't think that's too bad because we're gonna spend a bunch of time getting your questions answered. If you have any questions about what I showed you, let me know. Otherwise, let's get to the chat and, uh, and, and take a bunch of your questions. I had a great time yesterday for everybody that was here and I don't expect these questions to be any less awesome. Mm. And I've got my can I help you mug. That's me in my buffalo plaid shirt. How we doing? If you like that, um, give me the little thumbs up. Make sure you're subscribed. I always forget to say that stuff, but love having you guys. Let me see. Let me get rid of all my cards here. Let me get rid of everything that was in front of me. What do we got? John Bailey, how are you? I think I got John first at 955, an early bird. Amanda Sheldon, how you doing? Question. I am job searching in Dubai and a university degree is asked for most positions. Okay, I don't have one, but I do have 20 years of experience in my field. How do I communicate this effectively? Amanda, I would ignore, I, I know it sounds silly and I know a lot of you are gonna be shaking your head at me. If you've got 20 years of experience, if they're asking for a degree that you would have gotten 20 years ago, most companies will forego that. Job descriptions generally, this is worldly, not just in the United States, but worldly. Even if they post that a degree is required, it doesn't always mean it is actually required. So in your cover letter, I would say, I have 20 years of on-the-job experience related to whatever it is. I don't care if you have a degree or not. So even when my clients say, yes, we would prefer a four-year degree, we still submit as a recruitment firm, we still submit candidates without a degree. And lots of times they will hire them if they're the right person, if you've got the goods. So I don't, it's not that you need to be big and lofty in the way that you communicate it. If you don't have it, you don't have it. Just focus on what you do have. And then they're either going to say okay or not. But that's what I would do. I would not be afraid. That might, I mean, that's my way of saying go, go, go. Don't, don't hold back. Don't hold back. All right. Dagmar, hi. I re really appreciate the three Ds. Do you have a tip? How do you reach a referral in, uh, I'm not sure what you mean, the three Ds. Um, do you have a tip how to reach a referral, a situation with multiple targeted companies in a company did, Dagmar, I am not sure uh, what you are asking me. Do you have a tip how to reach a referral in a situation where multiple targeted contacts in a company did connect via LinkedIn but not, okay. Okay, wait, so let me see if I, let me see if I, I'm going to take a shot here, and I don't know that I have a really lengthy answer for you. People and Dagmar and anybody, if I read this correctly, you should not be connecting with people you do not know blindly and actually expect them to respond to you. Most people who connect with me 
cold, I will connect with them and never respond to them. So you, you have to have some context around who you are and what is likely to happen in the wake of you actually connecting. Okay, so I can't stand it when I get emails, especially from financial services people who send me a message and say, hey, me and my team are, you know, we looked at you, you're an executive, we've got these great financial vehicles, would love to connect. Because what I know is coming next is an email that's, or an, a message that's gonna sell me something related to that, and I don't want that. Okay, so if you are trying to get connected with people at a company that you want to work for, you need to do what I just said, those seven things, in a direct message, whether it's emailed directly or in mail directly. I don't care what the medium is that you use. It's totally okay. Okay, you could do it in mail. And you need to send them that message, not a connection request. And then if they reply, say, that would be great. Would you be up for connecting so we could leverage our networks and we can get connected online or whatever? That's fine. That is going to raise your chance of a response by 90 some odd percent. So I'm not sure what to tell you there other than don't do that if that is what you did. You can't make these people respond to you, but you put those seven tenets in there, they will respond in a, gr in a great percentage. I just showed you that, right? So, and then you said you have a question uh, yesterday, you remarked to shape resume towards where you want to change, how to approach titles, positions you held before. Well, you get the top half of the first, if you subscribe to my philosophy and resume writing, you get the top half of the first page to shape it toward where you want to go using whatever language you want. When you start getting into your titles, if you think the titles are different, uh, first off, if you have internal titles that are kind of wacky and you need to genericize them, you can, you can use some different techniques. You could do a couple things. You could put a different title in the title spot, and then you could put in your summary below the title, you could say internally known as, and then what the actual official title is, so you're not lying on your resume. Or you can switch it around and leave your uh, uh, lesser known nomenclature as your title, and then recalibrate it and say, known, you know, performing this type of function job, and so on, where you genericize it. Now, if you're asking, how do I change my, you can't change your titles. Your titles are what your titles are, or your function is what your function is. So I'm less concerned about that in the body of the resume, and I'm more concerned about how you position yourself at the top half of the, of the first page. That's your career profile, the two paragraphs, and it's your three highlights. And so I would, I would, I would do that. Then you're saying, keep as original, yes or no. I don't know what, or add a description, or just in the achievements. So I think I covered that one too. All right. Marketing manager to project manager. Okay, dang, Mark. Well, if you're a marketing manager, you have marketing projects. So you want to highlight the projects you've managed as a marketer and use language that are very common for project management in general. And the other thing that you should do, that anybody out there who wants to be a project manager should do, doesn't matter what your position is. I don't care if you're a salesperson, a marketer, product developer, or whatever. Just go to the PMI Institute, get your PMP certification. Anybody can get that. No one's stopping you, and you can slap PMP on your resume. I don't think PMP is the be-all, end-all or anything, but I think for somebody who wants to make a career change to a project management position, that's what I would do. I want to be an ops person, I go get my Six Sigma black belt. You know, these kinds of things. You should definitely do that. Anybody can do that. No one's stopping you. So that, that's what I would do there. That will lend some credibility. And then you, if you really want, you could put, I don't always recommend this, but it makes you feel better. Um, you know, you could put Dagmar the Wonderful comma PMP. I don't love doing that, but what I, I prefer to do if you start getting certs like that is in the career profile, in the, in the second paragraph at the end, put, you know, certif you know, P, you know, project management professional certification from Project Management Institute. You know, that's cool too. All right. What do you do? Uh, Ricky. What do you do when you've reached out to somebody via LinkedIn and you get no response? I'm finding trying to network hard. Any tips? Ricky, do what I just said for the whole show. And I also recommend that if you send somebody a LinkedIn message and don't get a response, get their email address 
and send them an email or vice versa. If you send them an email, then send them a LinkedIn email. But don't send it simultaneously. Send one and then wait a week and then send it via the other vehicle. And then just say, hey, I tried to reach you on LinkedIn and so on. I would do that. Now, I will also say you just saw, assuming you're still here, you saw what was inside the boot camp. In the boot camp, we teach you how to get their email address, how to verify it and make sure, what, what tool is all for, more or less free, uh, what tools to use to, make, to, to monitor what they did with the email if they actually open it. Somebody might not open your email. You'd want to know that. So that's why if you use some of these tools that we, we show you how to use, you'll be able to figure all that out and then you'll be able to adjust your follow-ups accordingly. So that's what I would do. Sam, I did see your email yesterday, Sam. We get, I get 3,000 emails a day. I couldn't respond to it and I'm gonna tell you what to do right now. First, I love you for the gesture. I would take that money and I don't want, don't donate it to me. Don't donate, I, I'd love that you appreciate all the free stuff. Don't donate it to me. You throw yourself in the leadership program. And the amount that you wanted to kick in will buy you a few months of that. Or if you wait a month, I'm going to have an annual package, which that will probably buy about a third of the annual package. You, of all people, should be in that program. So I will respond to your email, but I wanted you to know that I got it. And we're, I'm working around the clock, man. I mean, we're doing searches. We got multiple searches going. We got, got four days of live shows in a row. I got a boot camp starting up on Friday. I'm, uh, I'm working around the clock and trying to keep up with all the email and the questions that you guys have about the boot camp. But I appreciate that it was one of the nicer emails I've gotten in a long time. Adam Stark, how you doing? Great to see you again, man. You are like, you and Steve G got to be two of my top 10 favorite and, and you show up all the, all the time. I am doing well. Thank you. All right, Adam, when an interviewer asks a behavioral question, Name a time you solved the problem. What's the best way to answer to prepare for these? Adam and everybody, here you go. I've got no less than 80 assets on how to answer a behavioral interview question out there. Interview intervention, the book is free. If you have it already, well, okay, it's free. You get the ebook, the audio book, the hardcover book sent to your home anywhere in the world for seven bucks. You also get some other things that I'm not even going to go into. And inside the book, in chapter number five, which is the storytelling chapter, I break down exactly how to tell your stories and respond to any kind of behavioral interview question or any situational interview question. And those are the only two types of questions that are ever asked, no matter what, because the questions, there's only two types, questions about your past and questions about your future. And all the behavioral interview interviewing questions Fall in the past. Tell me about a time when. Okay, how did you solve this? What about when you had a disagreement? This and that and the other thing. Something you assembled. All these go goofy things. You can either do that or, or check out three keys to ace any job interview. That's the methodology. It's about an hour long webinar. Or what I would also do is I would also not only answer the behavioral interviewing question, I would answer that quickly and then I would also ask, do you have a similar situation in your environment just like the scenario I, I just discussed? So I could, I could tell you how I would handle that in your environment. Behavioral interviewing questions are the worst, not worst because they're tough, they're worst because they give the employer the least amount of information about you. And, and they, are the, they are the least, uh, the correlation between your response and the employer's ability to actually determine if you will be an effective employee is the worst. The best questions are situational questions that put you in their environment and ask you how you would handle this there because that's the real life stuff you're gonna have to deal with. Stuff that you gotta think about and, and tell them about a time you solved a problem in your, in your past that you can pick any problem you want that may or may not at all relate to anything that they do doesn't is a is a waste of their time and 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 yours candidly but to answer your question i've broken all that down for you and and i would go right to chapter five or i would watch three keys to ace any job interview cat harrison peterson 
Nice to exchange with you yesterday. Great to see you again. Hi, Andy and everyone. Cat from Minnesota. Fun and more efficient. It's fun and more efficient to watch my videos at 1.75. Come on, man. All right. The fun part is it makes him sound like he has way too much coffee. Actually, this is herbal tea. I had coffee this morning, probably like a whole pot. All right, hang on. Do you have a question? All right. Cecilia, my dear. Shout out from London from one of my boot campers. It's a bad time to apply for several different... Oh, is it banned to, over time, apply for several different jobs with the same company? No, I don't think so. Uh, if I don't apply, I won't get the job, but if I apply too many times... So, Cecilia, uh, and, and, and everybody, I do have a video out there about is it okay to apply to multiple positions at the same company. That video basically addresses if you want to do that simultaneously. As in, right now I'm job searching, I see you know, a senior engineer and a regular engineer position. Whatever, should I apply for both? We're not going to go into that. If you are um, applying to several jobs at the same company over time, there's two things that can have occurred. Maybe you applied to one and then you got an interview. If you got an interview and it didn't work out and then sometime later you want to apply to another one, I would not apply. I would go back to, I, th I answered this one yesterday, I would go back to uh, my contact, whoever that was. And I would say, I noticed another position has opened up. Now, if, I think her name was Jenny who asked the question. And then if, you know, if you left on good terms, meaning, hey, this, you know, Celia, you're, you're great. We just chose this other person because she had a little more experience or she was a little more in line with this and that or whatever. If, all, if it was all cool and it wasn't a, hey, Cecilia, we just don't see you fitting in this company, then I would go back to that person, the recruiter, the HR person, the hiring official or whoever, and say, hey, I see this other position. Can you route me to the right person or can you consider me for this one? Don't submit it in the applicant tracking system. Now, if the recruiter, uh, then, for, well, if the company's large and it, it you know, when you say several different jobs with the same company, my guess is the company is sizable, meaning multiple divisions, things of that nature. That recruiter should be forwarding your resume with some kind of recommendation to another recruiter or an HR person or the right hiring official, whatever. You want that. You don't want to go right into the applicant tracking system for all the reasons we talk about that you and I have gone back and forth about why you don't want to do that. They don't get seen, even if you're qualified and so on. You want you want somebody to say, hey, she interviewed for this position. We almost hired her. Uh, I think she'd be great for that. If they're not going to put that stamp on you, I would rather take my chances doing that than trying to put it in the applicant tracing. The recruiter doesn't reply to you or the HR person doesn't reply back, then yes, I would put it in the applicant tracking system. I would not recommend doing that first. I would not be concerned about applying too many times. I would be more focused on trying to get to the person who could help me navigate through the company. That's what I would do. I don't care if it's 20,000 people in the company. You got an in. Take advantage of that and, and, and hope that, that, uh, that they will recommend you. If you don't have an in, then I would try to find one using the techniques that you have asked, access to. All right. All right. Bangle baby, how you doing? I was wondering if that was Vegas. You're welcome. John Bailey, how you doing? By the way, I do want to say this. I know this is not a I know this is not a question. Uh, but Adam was asking about the behavioral interviewing questions, and John was pointing him to the star technique. I do not recommend the star technique. So I recommend the methodology that I give you to tell stories that make you memorable, believable, and likable. So the methodology that I've given you psychologically is proven, okay? The STAR technique will not always get in what you need to get in to trigger the psychological triggers that make them want to hire you, okay? It can be very, very drab. So I would not, you will never hear me recommend that and you will never hear me teach that methodology. So that's my opinion. It doesn't make, you know, I know a lot of other trainers that teach that. They think that's great. I, I think it's I think it's candidly I think it's lazy I think 
that trainers need to really look at what's working and they need to engineer, reverse engineer from experience what works and why it works and have evidence of the fact. I don't see that the STAR technique has that. So I would never do it that way. That's my, that's my opinion. That's my opinion. Doesn't, you know, all those trainers that want to recommend that on doesn't make them bad people. So that's my view on that. And my mother is here. Hey, mom, how are you? I've been super busy. I will try to call you uh, this weekend. Love you. Gary, how you doing? Driving an SD for an interview? Good luck, brother. All right, good luck, good luck. Can we send Gary, one of our vets and beloved boot campers, and a person I got to personally shake hands with, hug, and sign his book in Orange County when we had our meetup, a good luck workshop vibes, live off stars vibes with Ariana. Brooke Sachs, hey, another boot camper. Don, boot camp, love that. Vincent Bodino, how, nice to connect with you yesterday. I, I know I sometimes say this, I don't say this a lot. You all should connect with me. Send me your LinkedIn, you know, I, I think, you know, I'm happy to help you network, so I think we should be connected. If you're in my community, just send me a LinkedIn connection request and say, Andy, I'm in your community, would love to connect. Or I, I, I saw you on you know, Live Office Hour show, I saw you at the Job Search Accelerator workshop, would love to connect. I, you know, I'm connected with, I don't know, 15, 20,000 people, something like that. And you know, I also would encourage you to, to follow me on the, on the sites, like on Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn and those kind of places. Uh, but I'm, I'm happy to do that. Not something happened. The chat was rolling way too fast. Hang on. Here we go. But Vincent, great to get connected with you. Bengal Baby is in Nevada. Amar, I work with a large telecom. I was randomly transferred to a group in August. My boss says she has no work for me and refuses to assign me to a mentor. I have been, uh, I have been twice. I will be surplused. So first off, Amar, I'm assuming there's a question. I would, I'm, yeah, I wouldn't even know where to begin. But number one, you're never a surplus to me, and these things happen. If it's me, obviously I'm doing whatever I can to protect myself and and you know to provide whether it's just you or you and your family. And you know, I would, I would, I would get rolling on this stuff. I mean, I would get rolling. Wendy, hey, how are you? Yes, you are a boot camper and a leader. And Wendy, I am going to email you uh, as soon as I can catch my breath because I want to get a little more insight on the, e on the email you sent me about your case study for the leadership program. And I, I do think I want to speak about that on Wednesday, meaning I want to speak it, bring it to the group on, on Wednesday. So I maybe can use that as an example. Dennis, how are you from Portland? Hayden made it. Hayden, so we, it was great talking to you the other day, brother. I hope that kick in the run <laughs> was good. You know, I love you, brother. Uh, I'll kidding aside. I hope, uh, I hope, I hope you made some traction. Wendy Bader back again. Follow up to my cue yesterday all about including the cover letter as the first page. I remember you, Wendy. I remember the question. What do you suggest when the application system does not have separate areas? Well, I would probably then either not include the cover letter or or you can do this because I'm all about testing. I don't know how many applications. So, okay. First off, I would never go into the application process unless it was an absolute last resort. And so, the, Wendy, the first thing I would refer you and everybody else to is my networking videos, my job search networking videos, all the workshops like this where I talk about it. I would do that first, and I would I would try super hard. And if you are here tomorrow for our session, we're going to talk about the challenge where you don't do any of that stuff for two weeks, and you do other things. Meaning, I tell you what the tactics are that I want you to do, and it's about targeting companies and targeting people. If you can't find anybody, which is rare, and you absolutely have to go into the applicant tracking system, I would I would probably take some of my. Uh, uh, applications and put only my resume with no cover letter if that's the case then I would take others and and what you were doing you were embedding your your cover letter into your resume what I might do 
is I might put the resume in front and the cover letter in the back. Okay, if I was gonna do that, I know that sounds odd, but no one is gonna care if, if somebody actually goes to review your resume, mark my words, if somebody actually sees your resume, which you only have like a 3% chance of that happening, they will not care that your cover letter's in the back. And as a matter of fact, that's where they would prefer it because they would want to look at that second because they're not going to look at that until they review your resume. So that's another thing that you could do if you really want to include a cover letter, put it in the back. Actually, I've shot a video on how and when employers read cover letters. Check that out too, and it, 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 it goes to what I just said. Nobody, and I mean nobody, reads a cover letter. Okay, they don't read it first. They read your email, they open up your resume, and if they like your resume, they might glance at the cover letter. But they don't, it's not like they read your email, read a cover letter, and then go. That would take them so long even my four sentence cover letter it would take them so long to do. They just don't do that. So I would not. I would not be sweating this. I really wouldn't. And then, and then my point about testing is see which ones are getting hits. All right, Dave from England. How you doing, John Bailey? Hang in there, buddy. Bengal baby is Vegas baby. Not Kauai. All right, so. I have been to Kauai twice, and I love it. It's like heaven on earth. I would now you're talking to meet up in Kauai or Vegas. <laughs> hey, Brooke, good to see you again. Kim Getty, I think you texted me yesterday. I haven't read it yet. Timothy Branch, we got my boot cameras here. Any Ward, how you doing? Vincent from Colombo, Tampa. E dubs, how you doing? Is that E W maybe? Mary M C K. I now know your official handle that you're Mary from Oak Brook. Cat's got a question. Okay, here we go. I'm at Cat at 11:02. I gave up Facebook in 2016 and Twitter in 2017. My life is better without social. I still have LinkedIn. Is that enough for a job search? It is. Nobody has to be on social media. So, but you need a LinkedIn account now. What I would do, Kat, if I was you, is I would get back on Facebook, I would get back on Twitter, I would get on Instagram, and you don't have to post anything, but you can use that to follow. So you could follow me on Facebook. You could follow job sites. You can follow companies that you are interested in targeting and see what they're doing. See if they're posting anything. You'll be amazed at what you can pick up. On Twitter, same thing. Follow the hashtags, follow the companies, and then on Instagram, follow the hashtags. So, or the people, you can follow me. On Instagram, uh, I, will, I will be having a whole different Instagram strategy, but for right now, everybody who follows me on Instagram, they get their daily dosage of motivation and the quote cards, and then they get the occasional puppy picture and my wife you know, goofing off with me or whatever, but, uh, but I use, so you all don't have to be active on social media. Use tools to your ass, to, uh, use them as assets for your job, for your job search and just, just read. You don't have to post. You just follow. You could have, you know, zero posts and a bunch of things you're following. Robert Tatum. Hey buddy, Mike, how are you from Sioux Falls? Kathleen. Yes, you are a dear Stephen Curry, how you doing? Lori Granda, I think I got, I think I got you on YouTube yesterday. I think it's so hard. I'm, I'm, I'm like going through a mile a minute trying to respond to everybody. I think I got you. Kim Getty, how are you? How do I re-network with an ex-colleague when about three years ago she offered me a job and I turned it down? Kim, all right, now I know you. So you, all you need to do is call her and just say, hey, um. You know, I, 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 I almost, okay, so, so, so when I have situations like that, there's two, there's two ways you can approach this. Depending on the strength of your relationship, uh, you could call her up and pretend like nothing happened. That is actually okay. Hey, I'm in the market. You could say, hey, look, you know what? Timing wasn't great for me back then, or 
I really just felt like the other app was was better. But you know what? I, I've rethought it. I, you know what? I'm I'm back in the hunt. Would love to get connected. You know, if you have something great. If not, would love to have a cup of coffee. I'll drive out and you know meet you for lunch at your off near your office or whatever. I don't think I don't think you need to overthink it. You know, if 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 Kim, if I presented you uh, to a, a client and you turned down the offer, you'd still call. I expect you to still call me, right? Like, hey, Andy, I'm back in the game. Now, if as long as it was a legit reason, I mean, it was, you know, hey, I didn't fit culturally. I didn't think the position was going to make me grow. I whatever it wasn't enough money. You know, all that's cool. I don't. I don't. I would not overthink it. I would not overthink it. And Lori, yes, it will get better. And thank you guys for encouraging you. Guys, make sure you're subscribed so you get you get to me tomorrow and you don't miss the weekly videos too. And if you're liking this, hit the thumbs up button. Greg the Speed. Hello, Andy. Great to see you. You're committed. I, I don't know which Greg that is. Oh, is that... Uh, I got a bunch of Gregs. Which Greg are you? <laughs> hey, Veronica. Oh, Veronica, glad you mentioned this because this is one of the things that so many people expend so much emotional energy about and you shouldn't. Okay, Veronica Molina is asking, Hi, Andrew, if a recruiter looked into your LinkedIn profile, what can I message to this person? So, couple things. And I, what I'm, I'm going to give you an insider's view because I am a recruiter and we use LinkedIn and Kara and I, we look at profiles. Okay, now some people have their profile visibility, meaning our profile visibility about who we are if we looked at you, where it's turned on, meaning you can see that Andy Lasavita looked, or you can be turned off where it'll say anonymous or something like that. So first thing is, if it, so number one in general, if somebody looked at your LinkedIn profile, it means nothing, okay? It does not mean a thing thing because you have no clue what they were looking for or why they were looking all right so if they're not going to contact you i wouldn't do anything so let me give you an example uh and i gave this one a while back we'd started a new search uh, you know this is a few months back it was new at the time i looked at 800 linkedin profiles in the course of you know a few hours i put my search parameters in we opened it up I saw all the people I wanted to look at, and here's what I did. A recruiter, click, open, zip, close. Click, open, zip, close. I'm looking for something very specific, whether it's a corporate recruiter, whether it's an executive recruiter. 800, I found like five I liked, okay? The other 795, there's nothing wrong with those people. It wasn't what I needed at the moment for the client and the search that I was working at that time. If I'm a corporate recruiter, I could be opening profiles like this and they are not what I need. I close them, doesn't mat matter. It was like it never happened. Because you have to realize they're looking for something. If it's not in your profile, that doesn't mean anything's wrong with your LinkedIn profile. I was looking at things like, oh geez, that, I don't know, that person sells loans. I don't, I don't know how they got into this queue, but LinkedIn is not the brightest you know, system. As a matter of fact, it's the worst social media, or if we even can call it that, a platform out there on every level, on every imaginable level, other than the fact that we all as professionals, it is the number one site for professional networking. Other than that, LinkedIn loses in every imaginable category by miles, every imaginable, every imaginable. So other than, other than that, so don't worry, don't worry about that. And I would not necessarily message that person unless you discovered them and hey that's actually somebody in my target company then what i would do is i would send that recruiter uh one of the you know like the the networking messages or something like i talked about today with those seven things or a cover letter or something um directly to him or her but you have to understand when people are looking at your profiles you have no idea where they're looking so it was like you know in one hand on one hand i wasted you know 795 opens to get to five but it doesn't mean anything was wrong with those people so that's why when people say well so you know i'm always looking at who looked at my linkedin profile. i never look at who looked at my linkedin profile ever ever i never do that 
It's, a, it's, a, it's just, even if I was looking for a job or looking for clients or looking for candidates, we just, I just never do. So I know we beat that one up a little bit, but that's, that's the f fact of the matter. All right, Amanda, from Dubai, when networking on LinkedIn, what's the script for getting HR people to connect for job vacancies? You want the script, Amanda, join the boot camp. Otherwise, use some of the cover letters uh, that I have the cover letter playlist. Pick the one that is appropriate based on your situation and their circumstances. Melanie Newby, that's a boot camper. Jenny Hinkle, I think I was referring to you the other day about that question um, that I just went over a few questions ago. Rick, how you doing? Rory! My boot camper friend, The Zombie Review. John, how are you from Maryland? I always think of crab cakes every time I see your John SO60, SO603. Yeah, actually, Amanda, I think, you know, I know I told you to jump in the boot camp, which I want you to, but um, the boss hunting cover letter is pretty damn good. That will get you. You guys can't swing the boot camp, get all that other stuff. You, I would be leaning on that boss hunt, hunting cover letter every day. Every day. Joe Winner, hey, uh, can we all, I know it's a day later, Joe emailed me that he was going to miss yesterday's session because he was in an interview. Can we all give Joe a big applaud and send him some good vibes? Joe, I hope it went well. Uh, you know, it's, uh, you know, I'd be interested to know how it turned out. Connie Cotter, one of my favorite people. You are welcome. Adam L. Got a tricky question yesterday. When did you make a major error in your career and how did you deal with it? Any thoughts? Adam. Of course I have thoughts. All right. Folks, I know I've used this word a couple times today and you're probably going to hear me using it more and more. But... The responses themselves to questions like this, what the employer is ultimately looking for are behavioral traits and natural reactions that you have as an employee. Let's get really specific about what I mean. The fact that you made the error is irrelevant to them. Okay, The fact that you had a disagreement with somebody is irrelevant to them. What they are looking for is, is your natural tendency, your psychological trigger, is it to behave in the proper manner that leads to a positive outcome ultimately? So let's just take the couple examples I just threw up there. In your situation, what they ultimately need to hear is, you know what, I made this mistake, but it turned out to be awesome. Here's why. Because I got to learn this and it, it allowed me to, you know, take that mistake, rebuild something and a process so that mistake would never happen again. And I'm so thankful that that happened because now our error went, went down from you know 3% to 1.1% or whatever. And it's just, it's an awesome learning experience. And every time I encounter a challenge or any kind of mistake that I make, I automatically assume it was for my own good because I'm going to learn from it. Okay. You're positive, you learned something, you overcame it, you put something in place to insulate yourself. That is what life is all about, right? You're learning, learning, learning. You got a disagreement with somebody. You ever get that one? Hey, tell me about a time when you had to argue with a coworker because she hated you, hated you for eating her Skittles. Okay, like, what happened? Well, hang on. If we had a disagreement, I wanted to understand her viewpoint. So I wanted to seek to understand first. Then, so I listened. Second thing I did was then all, and I thought about, okay, well, hang on a second. She's got a point of view. I got a point of view. Instead of me trying to convince her of mine or her trying to convince her of me, can we take the best of all worlds? So can we make the, you know, the, the sum of the parts greater than the individual pieces? Boom. Then if, if, you know, if I, anytime I also have a disagreement where you know, we, we still kind of agree to disagree, then what I try to do is I try to explain to the person the benefits of doing it this way. And anyway, the, 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 the things that they're listening for, what they heard is, okay, this isn't somebody who runs off half cocked. It's somebody that is going to be agreeable to work with. It's somebody that's going to be open minded and welcoming of new ideas and willing to share his own and willing, you know, you know what I mean? Like, that's what they're looking for every single time. So that before any of you that are going into interview prep, 
When you go into interview prep, you it's not just the questions that you think they're going to ask you. It's knowing why they're going to ask you these questions. So in the interview intervention book that I held up a little while ago, if you go into that, there's a section in there about the 14 most effective job interview questions. 14. If they ask those 14 just in a row, if they just read the book and just asked you those questions, they would know 85% of what they needed to know about you. Now, those 14 can be looked at differently and varied, and I have 43 variations of those 14. So now there's 43 possibilities and reasons why they ask these base things about you. Every single thing, no matter what anybody does, this is at the core of whether they will be successful. And then there's the rationale as to why they ask that, the proper responses, and, and why. So the interview intervention book is fantastic for that. And the, the important thing is, what you need to recognize is when a question like that is asked, what are they actually looking for? And then your story needs to coincide with what they're looking for. Follow me? I think I think you do. All right. And the good news is, at least for the next 36 hours, this replay will be available. That's another thing, folks. These replays are coming down Thursday night. So uh, if, you, if you're missing some of this uh, or you missed yesterday's, make sure you make sure you check it out. Jenny Hinkle, you are back. I remember you with the little red hair on your face. Uh, I work in medical software and halfway through getting my MS in IT management. Cool. That will also get me a CAPM certif- Great. Uh, but Dream PM job popped up yesterday. Do I go for it now? Yes. Final answer. Your dream jobs, folks, never pop up right when you're looking for them. Okay? So they just don't. Now, they rarely. Okay? When you are in dire need of something, it ain't happening. Companies, when they hire, I tell them, your dream candidate is not just going to pop up right at this minute because you need him or her. That's why you need to be interviewing people all the time to look for the dreams. That's why, Jenny, and people like you, you should always be open, no matter what you have going, to let the universe throw the most wonderful possibilities in, in your way and then take advantage of them. And then what I would also do is if you are in the middle of getting your MS, is there a way that you could continue on and get that on nights and weekends? So, you know, my, um, you know, my, my uh, wife, uh, Linda, her son, Garrett, got a job as a network security engineer when he was 20. He was getting ready to transfer colleges. And he was at a hacker convention. And somebody said to him, hey, you should go interview for this position. The kid went in and he beat out master's degrees, internal candidates, and everything. And they said, well, you're in, you know, we, we'd hire you. You're in school. Um, he said, well, I'll, can I work the night? I'll work the night shift. And, you know, I mean, he, that's what he did. So, I mean, it just, it just happens that way. You know, you just, it's never going to be right when you need it to. So I don't ever let awesome opportunities like that go if it is truly something you want. Now, what I would also say to you is, but I would be darn picky. I would make sure that, so like in in going back to my boot camp, the first parts of the boot camp are all about self-discovery, your internal drivers, your, your whys, your wants, your needs, and everything that you have to have in order in order to assess whether this job is truly worth changing what you're doing at this moment, whether it's your present situation. Everybody has a present situation. Sometimes it has, they have, you have a job you like. Sometimes you have a job you love. Sometimes you don't have any job at all. Sometimes you're in the middle of school, whatever it is. Right. So does this opportunity and the, the, the benefits of it in the short and mid and potentially long term outweigh what I'm doing now? Is it way better and is it smart? So that's and only that can you answer. But I could teach you the process to go through. Dan Morris, did you get my did you get my thing this morning? Per our conversation, my second interview with one employer this morning went great and they will get back to me Friday. Awesome. All right, hang on. So we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna answer your question right here. Okay. So let me paint let me paint this story for everybody because 
Dan Dan is in the boot camp, and this happens a lot with the boot campers, and um, and it actually happens a lot with a lot of you. Bless your hearts, where you get into an interviewing process, and you 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 have multiple streams going, two or three or whatever, and we all know this. They're never running completely on the same track. Nobody says we're all going to end on Friday for Dan's benefit and we're all going to give Dan offers on Friday and then Dan can choose, right? This one's running two weeks ahead. This one stalls a bit but says we love you. We're going to pick this up in a week when the boss lady gets back. Uh, we, disp- we expect we're going to get our decision by the end of the month. Okay, so without knowing all the permutations and all the combinations because the speed at which they move is is your is your lead horse moving faster, moving slower. Uh, you know, do you need more interviews? You don't know if you're going to get the offer. If you get the offer, does the first one blow you away? Is it subpar? There are so many things that you need to account for in these variations. But I want to give everybody an idea of what to do when you are in multiple streams, whether that's two or three or four, or however many interviewing processes you're going through, and you are not sure what to do with whether you get an offer, whether you don't get an offer, if you get an offer first and then the other one comes second, or you know this one wants an answer and you don't have the other one yet, what do you do? This is the easiest way to accommodate everybody and the best you're gonna be able to do is when you get into any interviewing process, please, please let every employer know what's happening, okay? Hello, company A, I'm actually just interviewing with you. Great, then company B comes along. Well, go back to company A, hey, I wanna let you know, I'm loving the process, I wanna let you know I started another interviewing process with company B. Company B, by the way, I'm currently in the process with company A and I've had a phone screen. I've had a phone screen and a second technical interview, whatever it is. And there should be dialogue going the whole way through about where you are. You're not being pushy, you're being communicative. You wanna know if they have other candidates, you wanna know if they're in charge. You need to share with them where everything is. Now, as you get further down, the company starts to communicate with you. Hey, Dan, we, 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 we love you. We want to make sure uh, that we can give you an offer, and we anticipate the offer will be coming at the end of the week. That's company A. Company B, you go back to company B. By the way, I just got word company A is going to send me an offer by the end of the week. I just want you to know. Now, the, what you say to company B depends on whether you really like company A or whether you really prefer company B, or whether you really prefer company C. So you gotta go back to company B and you either say, hey, but you know what, I want you to know, while I'm looking forward to getting the offer from them, I really love you and I re- you're my first choice. If they're not your first choice, you'd say, I'm getting an opportunity, company A is gonna be giving me an offer on Friday, that's what they've communicated, I wanted to let you know. Is there anything that we, can, you know, is there? I just want to let you know, and I just want to ask, I recognize if there's not, is there anything we can do to expedite your process? Could we move it? You know, is there any chance I can meet with the boss lady this week instead of next week? Or, or if that's not possible, can you please let me know when you expect me to, to, to have the next step? Because at least that way, I can communicate to company A what the timing might look like. That's all. All you're doing is you're going back and forth and you're, you're, you're rephrasing or, or, or re-jimmying what you want to say based on your preference. So you want to know how pushy you need to be or how not pushy you need to be. And don't go speculate. I mean, company A could give you an offer on Friday, totally lay an egg. Be like, what? Oh my God, goodness. Then you say to them, hey, you know what? I need to finish out with company B. All right? Or, and you know what? You're going to need to raise that like 50 grand. Or whatever. Like, so you got it. All you need to do in your case now is, hey, go back to company, the other company, and just say, hey, I know the timing here was, you know, toward the end of the month. It's tick tock, July tenth. Okay. So, um, uh, I just I want to be respectful. That's a good word to keep in there, right? To the first company who's about to give me an offer on Friday or next Friday. I really like you. I want to make sure that there's a chance, you know, that I have, a, or at least a better understanding. If there isn't, I respect that, and I, I will I will let you know more when I get the offer and what I'm going to do with it. 
and you will get instant feedback. And if you at, just ask politely and are communicative. Now, if you have set the tone from the beginning that you are a communicative person, it is a hell of a lot easier to go back to them every time and say, hey, you know what? This one's progressing a little further. I promise I will keep you apprised if anything changes. Other than that, that's all I want you to know. They will know that you are like that. It doesn't, you, you're not, you're not, it, it, the tone doesn't need to be, hey, look, you know, I'm getting this off of Friday. You better hurry up, right? It's just, I want to let you know. So I just wanted to reach in to see if there's any insight regarding, you know, if the decision, you know, if you're firm on the end of the month or if we can move it up a little bit. And if not, I understand, but I wanted to ask. And that's it. That's all you can do. And then, then you let, then you let it roll from there. You get the offer. Then you got to decide, do you want to take it? You want to press? You want to go back to the other company and say so long. You want to go back to the other company and say, listen, I really, really want to, you know, try to, you know, expedite this process. I've got the offer, and you know, I've I've asked them for some time. They're only willing to give me a week, two weeks, or whatever. You can, you just have to share. It's just, it's you just have to share. So that's what I would do. That's what I would go back to the company with. And if there are, you know, the other employer with a lot of applicants. Um, you said much larger company with many applicants for the position without them removing me. No, just do what I said. And then they're either going to, you know, you're either going to decide you take the first one or, you know, or you wait it out. I'm a, I'm a bird in the hand guy. I really am. And if a company loves you, they will expedite. If they don't love you, they won't expedite. And then you'll have your answer that way too. All right. Hope that serves you all. All right. We have a lot of these boot campers that have lots of opportunities and multiple offers. Ah. <laughs> uh, and Dan is telling everybody to use the boss hunting cover letter to get that one. That's awesome. Jenny, don't overthink life. Alina, how are you? How long should a message be if on LinkedIn you're limited on characters? If it's on LinkedIn, it's not limited on characters. You can write a book on LinkedIn, um, and Alina, and and it just breaks the message. It's not a big deal. And what I would say is, it depends on what the message is. Now, if you're going in cold, you don't want to be this long. I when somebody sends me an email, even if it's a warm one, I don't read the email from left to right, top to bottom. I open I, my eyes, look at the whole email, and I look for where the person tells me what they want. I literally, that's I literally try to black out everything what they want. And so I love it when some people say to me, "Any, I have no questions in this email. I just want to let you know, Any, here's my question. Here's the background. Like now, everybody who's emailing me, they 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 know they know these things, but I don't like to make them. I don't like to make them too long. Like, don't they shouldn't be longer than that? So, it's it's and and um, if you look at the boss hunting cover letter, you can shrink it a little if you want. You can leave it as it is, and I wouldn't lengthen it. If that, you know, maybe that'll give you an answer there. N E Ward, in these networking messages, do you mention you were laid off? Absolutely not. And this is why you're reaching out. No, no, you don't. Super, that's superfluous information. And if it's you're reaching out to somebody cold, they don't need to know that. I'm reaching out because I noticed you worked at. I'm I'm, I'm trying to build relationships with people in my space. Whatever this is like. Never, never would I do that. Actually, this is a pretty interesting thing that Hayden's saying about the PMP certification. So some, and that it's a paradox, it means everything and nothing. I would include it on your resume that you are pursuing it. I would, if you are pursuing any education, any trade schools, anything, any educational degrees, bachelor's, associates, master's, PhD, CPA certification, anything you got, it's okay to put it in there. It, it doesn't hurt you. It, it won't hurt you. Some people will like it. Some people won't care. When you tell me you're PMP certified, I really don't care, okay? But some employers will like that. And if you are a career changer, you definitely, it makes, it makes a difference, okay? So that's, that's important. Kat, 
Uh, do you advise a networking email include a read receipt? Yes. So in the boot camp, we show you the tool that we recommend and we show you how to do that. And the individual who is opening it has no idea that there's tracking on it. So I would, yes, I would recommend that. And the reason that I would recommend that is because number one, it will do wonders for your mental state. It will, because knowing is better than not knowing. Like what happened? Did they open it? Did they forward it? How long was it open? Did they actually read it? And so on. The other thing is, if they didn't open it, hang tight, see if they open it, then see what happens. I might not, if, if I don't get a notification that somebody read that, why am I gonna follow up with them in three days if they haven't even opened the email? Then they open it in the fourth day. Then I don't hear from them, but the fourth day starts my counter. Now I wait seven days. So like, you know, I, I just, I like, information is good. What you do with it is entirely up to you, but why not? Dave Weston, hi, Andy. I met the global lead of a division of a major bank. Awesome. And connected with him on LinkedIn. I discovered a suitable vacancy, but it's in a different division. Yes. How do I make use of the contact? Dave. Well, first, I one of those is in there. Uh, you know somebody at a company and you want to get referred. So one option is you let me be your copywriter and you do that. The other option is you just reach out to the contact and you say, hey, I noticed there's a position in this division that looks like it would be interesting and appealing for me and I think I would be a great fit. Do you know anybody that I can speak to about it? I mean, you can flower it up, but that's the approach. Carl Pettit, Andy, I've been, at the, I've been at the same level for 10 years, though my responsibility have consistently grown. I want a higher level position, but is this unrealistic? No. Carl and everybody else, titles don't mean nearly what you think they mean as far as the value when you are job changing. I really don't care if you were a director or a VP or a senior vice president or an associate or a principal or whatever, because that's not important to me. What's important to me and most is what was your function and what were your duties and what were your responsibilities? Now, I don't really care if you're a director for 10 years. Maybe you work for a small company and there's one VP and that VP's gotta die or leave in order for you to, in order for you to get to the next level. I wanna see you know, progression. And what you can do is, and, and I don't know what the rest of your resume looks like. Oh, wait, hang on. You're, uh, to clarify, meaning that I'm worried it's a red flag that I haven't already ascended. No, that's not true. You're 50. Don't worry. Okay, so let's say you got your 50, 28 years of work experience. You've been at a director for 10. I don't know if you were at, you know, you were at a director when you started at the company and you're still there. Or, yeah, wait, you said same level, but not same company. Okay, so I don't, so Carl, do me a favor, because this is actually really good. Can you go to the bottom of the chat and let me know uh, if the if the 10 years were at the same company or a different company. Because for, for everybody's benefit, if, if you were a director at one company for three years and you went to another company, you were a director for seven, I, there's not a big red flag, I don't really care. If you were a director at your own company for 10 years, same company, uh, I may or may not care, right? It, it, it depends what your org structure is like. I am more concerned with are you... Um, uh, what are your duties? So if if you were a um, if you were a director at the same company, can even at the same company, can you show a progression of responsibilities? You know, between you can say you you don't have to say director two thousand and nine to two thousand nineteen. You can say that, and then you could say you know you can you can put. Uh, like you could create your own like little functional titles in there. So from like, you know, 2009 to 2011, I was doing this. From 2012 to 2015, I was doing that. And for, you could do that. No one's stopping you. And then you, you give me little functional groups that show a, an evolution. And then what I care about is, well, I don't really care that you're a director because I might be moving you to a, a, a company where you're gonna be a manager and make 50 grand more, or you might be a vice president and make 10 grand less. Okay, so it, it, th that stuff is nonsense. That I don't, we don't care about your titles. We care about the functions. So you could show that evolution 
if you wanted to. Now, if you are a, if it's across companies like three and seven or five and five, whatever, well, this company could have been a really large company and you were a director and then you went to a smaller or medium sized company who has one VP, right? And then a CFO and a CIO and whatever. And that's just the structure. I, you know, it's not, and you're 50, so you still got a lot of, I mean, some, you know, if you're not independently wealthy, you want to work a long time. But none of that, uh, no, I, the, 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 the trick for you is making sure that you're showing you continually learned, you continually progressed, you continually took on new things, and you could do that. You, you can create your own view of that. So I don't know if you, if you gave me any more color, but I, I think I probably covered it. Okay. Mike, uh, over 60 and running into the age issues, ran into several bad companies, very short term in each one, less than six months. How do I address them on the resume? Mike, uh, I, I think you need a combo of some assets that I have out there. Uh, one is the job hopper video. I have a video on job hopping. I'm calling you a job hopper, just, but if you got to answer that question, check that one out. Then uh, I would check out my age discrimination videos. There's uh, you know, age discrimination in an interview. And I'm going to give you one really quick tip here too. There's age discrimination in, in an interview or overcoming age discrimination in an interview. And the other thing is there is a, uh, a job searching for over 50 year olds video. All y'all in my demographic and those like Mike, let's say in our 50s and our 60s and our 70s. I'm not gonna go through all the steps because I don't wanna reshoot the video for you right now regarding how to overcome age discrimination in an interview. There's easy ways to overcome the age issue on the resume. You can drop dates off, you can cut the stuff, all that's easy. So let's say you get into the interview. Now, there's no hiding that this guy's gonna be 53 next month, okay? So wish me happy birthday uh, for next month. And Mike's 60. Okay, so you come in, we see you, right? You're 60, I'm 53. So then what I always say is, what are the issues that you're going to have to face? Well, they think you're stuck in your ways. They don't think you're on the cutting edge. They don't think you move fast enough and you're not innovative enough. Hang on, I got to swap something here. Okay. I just realized I, I didn't have the slack in the proper spot, Kara. Sorry. Okay. Um, but so you've got some issues like that related to your, uh, to, to related to being older it's not that you are old and not valuable because you have a lot of experience, right? Same, same with me. It's the, what, you're, what you're combating, all of us in, in our, my demographic, we're combating the biases that the interviewers have. So one of the easiest ways, and you can apply this to whatever the biases are. You go watch those other videos. I'll give you a host of them. But let's say we take the innovative one or the fast-paced one. Uh, we had a boot camper um, and he, he, he had this issue where he thought the interview went well. They came back. They, they were a little concerned. He, his feedback to me was he thought that they thought that he wasn't going to do well in the fast-paced environment. So I would, get, I would get an idea of what all these are. It's not, they're not hard to figure out. And then what I would make these issues, I would make them my problem, which is what I'm looking for, in my new company. So to offset somebody's bias, you need to preempt it. So for example, if I walk in and they think, well, Andy, you're 53, you're not, you're gonna have a hard time in our fast paced environment. I'd probably laugh and say, you're gonna try to keep up with me. But let's just say that's what they think about me. I could say, you know, one of the things that I'm really looking for in my new company is I need a fast environment. And the reason I need a fast environment is I know I thrive when, and it's important for me to be innovative. And you know, my last company, it was very difficult. One of the reasons that I'm, I'm open to moving or I wanted to leave was because it was very stagnant. They were a little slow to change. They were like, you, you offset and preempt everything as you're describing what's important to you. You do that repeatedly. You do that up front with the screen, right? You do it in the tech screen. And tech I don't, doesn't need to be tech. I mean, it could be whatever the domain screen is for you and so on. And what you do is you constantly preempt the things that are typically natural biases. So try, try that. And uh, I would say that you know anybody can use that. 
for anything, but especially folks in, in my demographic and Mike's demographic. Okay, Alina, using today's guidelines to send networking emails, does it seem that you're using the contact for selfish reasons? You are. It's a fact of the matter. Finding a job, or should you ask them first for an informational interview? Alina, don't ask for informational interviews. Don't ask for informational interviews. Just straight away, what is it that you need? I'm growing my network. I'm trying to, you know, this is what I'm doing. This is what I need from you. Okay, so I don't even like the word informational interview. It's, it's uh, there's, to me, there's no such thing. If you're getting together with somebody who has an ability to either hire you, recommend you, send you somewhere or whatever, consider it an interview. And, or, and, and I know you're trying to build the, the, the network, but the fact of the matter is that if this person can be valuable, what, what, here's what I need, here's what I can offer, and are you up for it? So that, that's what I would do. I would not, and, and, and the other thing too, Alina, I really would check out the boss hunting technique if you were not familiar, and that will, you will be able to expand on that. Um, I mean, the boot campers is great because they get, they get them, I wrote them all for them, and I just say, insert this here, insert that here, insert that here. Um, but if, you, if, if you're not gonna go that route, then I would take the boss hunting cover letter and I would try to make some sense of it there. Kirsty. B, my boot camper. Oh, wait, she's just commenting. Catherine, you are never late. Right on time. Marite, hey, how bonjour to you. First seven minutes. No, I'm just kidding. Well, you could, you, do you know, you all know when we do these lives that wherever I am makes no difference. You can take your cursor and just slide it back to the beginning. Because I have YouTube set up, so this is it like a DVR. So if anybody pops in, for those hundred and some out of you that are here, if you want to go back to the beginning, you just slide it back. Now you would, it makes no difference. You just go in the chat. The chat's real time, but you could watch. And when you slide back, you'll see the chat in real time. But you just go put your comment in wherever it where it doesn't matter where I am. You can you can be on your own schedule. I don't know if you know that. Awesome. And you, you're going to have the replay here in a few minutes. All right. We are coming down on the close. Let me see if I can get one more in here. Point number one. <laughs> All right, Mayor. Oh, Diana, how are you? All right. Mary from Oak Brook, great content for these emails. Any thought on the subject line? I would make the subject line... Uh, I, so two, 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 two points here, Mary. Number one, don't overthink the subject line. The person you are sending an email to is getting a one-of-a-kind email from you. Your subject line is likely not going to be a big indicator of whether they were open it, as opposed to me, who sends you emails every Tuesday, and then when we have promotions, like you're in a little cluster for those of you on my email list, you're getting, well, you're getting really a, kind of a lot, sorry about that, but you're, I want you to have a reminder so you come to the show. There's a message probably after this, it's gonna talk to you about the boot camp. That's a cluster. I have to be concerned, very concerned about my subject lines because, and, and I have to respect that my subject lines need to be in alignment with the content in the email, otherwise you don't trust me, okay? If I say something, it needs to be there. For you all, don't overthink that. You, it, I understand you want to be, you know, you want to be enticing, but just something warm and casual, direct, and then it depends who the person is that you're sending it to. So, you know, if you're sending a boss hunting cover letter, you could just say, "I'm interested in working with you or your, you and your company," or you know, or you know, do you have any room on your team or whatever? I mean, like, it doesn't have to be, you know, or, or inquiry from Mary from Oakbrook. It doesn't, it doesn't need to be super, super weird. I'm just, just make it plain and simple. I want you to be you. And, you know, I get asked that question quite a bit, but don't overthink it. Really, it's not, it, it, it you don't have to. Okay, folks, I gotta run. Um, couple things. See, so you, you got a little peek of the boot camp today. Uh, you will get another message or two about the program. We start Friday. We start a series of five straight boot, camp, boot camping uh, sessions in a row. Those are private. 
They're a couple of hours each. I get through the questions of the people that are in there, and those are recorded for you and all that good stuff. The boot camp is fully available, so if you enroll today, you get it all. That stuff I showed you, you get it all and then some because I didn't even show you all the other bonuses and things that are in there. But it's really a great program. Plus, you get all the templates. You get all the written stuff. You get more instruction on the stuff we talked about today. You get a lot deeper stuff about how to find people, how to locate them, how to get their address, how to know if they read your email, all that stuff. So we're going to come back tomorrow. Uh, I have a lesson on you know, kind of the high-priority activities for the job search itself what to do, I have a challenge, I have some things that you're gonna encounter that are gonna be problems, and what to do about them. So it's gonna be a lot of fun. Last one, same thing, noon Eastern, 11 Central. Until then, I will see you all be good.